What's up, Hearth and Homies? Welcome to the OTR Visual Radio. Tonight's compilation is The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Gerald Moore as Marlowe. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe was a radio series featuring Raymond Chandler's famous private eye. The program first aired on June 17, 1947 on NBC as The New Adventures of Philip Marlowe, with Van Heflin playing the role of Marlowe. This show was a summer replacement for Bob Hope. In 1948, the series moved to CBS, where it was now titled The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, and it featured Gerald Moore as Marlowe. By 1949, it had the largest audience in radio, and that series ran until 1950. From July of 1951 to September of the same year, the show ran as a summer replacement for Hopalong Cassidy. Once the show made the move to CBS, Gerald Moore played Marlowe in every episode except for one. In the 1950 episode, The Anniversary Gift, William Conrad filled in as Marlowe. Now, this show was seen as the most hard-boiled of all the hard-boiled detective shows out there. Raymond Chandler decided against exercising his right to have script approval because he just wanted to sit back and enjoy the show and was said to be moderately pleased with uh, the treatment of his characters. And we hope tonight that you'll be moderately pleased as well. So we've taken this classic old-time radio show and added a visual component to it for a unique old-time radio viewing experience, the OTR Visual Radio. So sit back and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This one began as the threat of a beating that turned into murder with a brown-eyed blonde, a jovial hippopotamus, and a tough ex-soldier of fortune, all complicating the problem until I got next to the key man. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, star as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Key Man. Along about dusk, Hollywood Boulevard is some desolate place between the end of work and the start of play and about as boisterous as taps. So except for a sallow-faced masher leaning against the nearby storefront warming up his evening leer, I was alone on a lot of fancy pavement when I walked up to the box office of the Newsreel Theater near Cahuenga. Paid my 40 cents admission tax included and started inside, where, of all places, I was to meet my new client, one Mark Hummel. He'd called my office at 6.35, and in a tight voice, fringed with fear, urged me to find him in the last row, last seat, far left of the Boulevard Cinema at once, if I could use a $50 bill. It was exactly a quarter to seven when I crossed the length of lobby to aisle four and entered the theater proper, which was almost empty. It was two minutes after that before I could see well enough to tell that the man all alone in the aforementioned seat, who wore white French cuffs protruding out of gray flannel, a pleated frown and not paying any attention to the bathing beauties on the screen who were water skiing through Florida's Cypress Gardens, had to be my client. I eased in and sat down next to him. I could see he was watching me out of the corner of his eye. Marla? Yeah. My plane leaves for New York in half an hour. Well, watch it, honey. You ought to see that I'm on it and in good health. Who wants it otherwise? Barney Kovac, an ex-soldier of fortune who thinks with his fists. He works as straw boss in a garage where they park cars. He's threatened to kill me with his bare hand. Why? What'd you do? Nothing, nothing. It was perfectly legitimate. Mm -hmm. He had a chance to get out of Hippo Link's place. Uh, Get out of whose place? Hippo Link. Oh. Uh, Kovac had a chance to buy a location of his own. But you got there first. Look, Mr. Hummer, why don't we continue this in the lounge? It's quieter out there. Uh, Yes, what if you think? Yeah, yeah, come on. Oh, this is better. Uh, Come on, we can talk over here. So, uh, you beat Kovac out of the property he wanted. Then what happened? And when he found out, he went crazy. <laughs> he swore I bribed the real estate broker, high-pressured the owner. Mm. All that kind of wild talk, you know. Mm. Now, Marlowe, the place I bought from under him is a good investment. Oh, yes, yes. But chicken feed compared to the deal I'm going to close in New York tomorrow. If I get there. So, for 50 bucks, I'm to see that you do just that, huh? Uh, yes, but I've already uh, made your work easier. I told Hippo Link... Uh, 
All 300 pounds of it. Oh? I told him in a loud voice this afternoon that I was going out of town by train at seven tonight, uh, figuring, of course, that Kovac, who's nearby, but wouldn't do anything with people around, would uh, overhear me. Mm-hmm. And your connection with Hippo is what? I park my car in his garage. Period. Anyhow, at 5.30 tonight, I drove downtown to the Union Station. I left my car on the lot there and went inside. After which you doubled back, got outside into a cab and headed for here in a comfortable wait until plane time, which you're afraid might not fool anybody, including the tough Mr. Kovac, since you've hired me, right? Uh, yes, that's right. I never caught sight of him trailing me, Milo, and uh, frankly, well, I'm... I'm afraid of him. Can you understand that? Sure. Fear is always understandable. Well, what's the itinerary, Mr. Hummel? Here to the airport? Uh, no, 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 no. First to my house. I still have a bag to pack. I'll take a cab. You follow in your car. Then wait outside my place. That's 4100 Fountain. And just below La Siena. Yeah, I know. Yes. Now, uh, when I get back into the cab, you follow again. Until I'm safe aboard the plane. Yes. Now, here. Here's your money. Right. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you carry a gun, Mr. Hummel? Ordinarily, no. But tonight, Marla, yes. It's a service gun, 45. And believe me, if I have to use it, I will. Now, let's get out of here. Quickly. I was 20 minutes playing follow the leader up through Hollywood to Fountain Avenue as far as the neat cube of stucco that was number 4100, where I parked behind the taxi lights out and waited. Until I heard a frightened scream from what had to be Mark Hummel. I piled out of my car and darted past the cabbie who said he had enough trouble in his life and ran up the front steps and into the house where in the light of a single overturned lamp in the bedroom, I found my client face down in a widening pool of his own blood. I started for the rest of the rooms, but then the sound of a motor roaring out of the alley behind the house told me I was wasting my time. When I returned to the bedroom, one glance at Hummel's still form said that the man who had been afraid for his life only 30 minutes ago was already very dead. Next to his body was the 45 he never got to use, and alongside of that, the miniature crystal ball splattered with blood that had killed him. There was a key which I found fit the front door, lying in the middle of the carpet. The drawers and closets were all open, as well as his half-packed suitcase. It was a good time to call the police. Uh, Detective Lieutenant Matthews speaking. Marlo, Lieutenant, I'm at 4100 Fountain and standing next to a man named Mark Hummel who used to be a client. He's dead, Matthews, murdered. Oh, any idea who did it, Phil? Well, I got an idea. It might be a lot of muscle called Barney Kovac who works in a garage on Santa Monica Boulevard. You sure it wasn't a robbery killing? No. Well, you know, we've had a lot of second story jobs there about every three weeks in that neighborhood. I'm not sure of anything yet, but you see, I was high... Uh-oh, company, Lieutenant. I'll catch up to you later. Mark, I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Is, is Mr. Hummel in? Yes and no. Did he expect you? Well, no, he didn't. Who are you? Philip Marlowe. Well, is Mark in or not? Yes, he's in. You'll find him in here, if you insist. Oh, thank you. I I'm sorry I bit your head off, but what I have to... Oh, no. He's dead? Shot with that? No, no, it's his own gun. He was beaten to death with that glass ball there. Oh. That key is his, too. It fits the front door. I already tried it, and then I put it back when I found it, since the police appreciate neatness on the scene. But that I... doesn't make sense. Mark always carried his keys in a leather case. Oh? It should be right there in his right pocket. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. House key with a bunch of others, and, uh... Yeah, this one matches the one on the floor. How'd you know about this? Oh, I I'm an old friend of Mark's, Mark. You'd have to be. What were you in such a hurry to tell him? I don't remember. Maybe I can help you. Maybe it was a little message you were going to deliver from Barney Kovac. I don't know anyone by that name. And since that leaves us with very little in common, Marlowe, I think I'll leave with only this forty-five here for companionship. Oh, fine. Now, get over there against the wall and turn your back. We'll go on. Now what? And don't move until you hear me drive away. Or your health will suddenly be very, very poor. Good night. <laughs> When Little Red Riding Hood slammed out of the place, I knew I could either follow her or wait for Matthews to siren up to the front door and then tell all. One last look around the room, including the key in the middle of the carpet, made me change my mind again. If the key could be traced, it might be a definite link to Kovac, so I headed for Hippo Link's garage on Santa Monica Boulevard in the hope of further information about a hot-tempered man who worked there. 
than five minutes later, I was walking down a cement ramp that dropped from the street level into an acre of underground parking space filled with a crowd of heavy with chromium cars that belonged to the fashionable neighborhood nearby. Hippo himself was a perspiring oval, approximately 5'8", measured in any direction, with tiny eyes, tiny nose, and a dozen chins that danced when he laughed, which seemed to be always. He was standing next to a pickup truck marked Ace Battery Shop, so talking to the driver. To get, huh? And because of that, you want more money for him, huh? <laughs> that, I suppose, is easy to get. Now, look, Hippo, I... Listen, Plume, I won't pay anymore. My overhead's too high already. So if you can't get them for me at the same price, forget the whole deal. Besides, I don't like the way you do business anyhow. Meaning what, Hippo? Meaning that when I give you an order, Plume, I want it delivered to me in person, not to just any flunky that's standing around. Okay, okay. That was a slip. It won't happen again. Yeah, not twice it won't. <laughs> Goodbye, Plume. I got customers. Hey, can I help you, mister? Maybe. I'm looking for Barney Kovac. Is he around? Uh, no. Why? What do you want him for? Maybe murder. What? Barney, he killed someone? If... Wait a minute. Plume, I said goodbye. Go on, beat it. Okay, okay, Hippo. I'll see you around. Let's, let's go in the office here, mister. A little quieter. Yeah. Sit down. Thanks. You a cop? No, private detective. Name's Marlowe, Hippo. Marlowe, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> never heard of you. No, but then, uh, I, I never heard of a lot of people, huh? <laughs> Mm, that's right, Hippo. People like, for instance, Mark Hummel. <laughs> Why him, Marlowe? He was the one Kovac killed. Well, 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 what do you know? Doesn't seem to break you up. Why should it? Hummel was a louse, Marlowe. Everybody said so. Of course, I didn't know him personally, except a joke with him when he brought his car in. You know, a little laugh goes a long way with some guys. <laughs> mm. Tell me, Hippo, did you know that Hummel was going out of town? Yeah, he told me this afternoon. Should have gone yesterday, huh? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you don't like jokes. I no. can play it straight. What do you want? For an open of this. A tall blonde with brown eyes and a pretty face who knows how to handle a forty-five as well as conversation walked in here, would you know her? Am I? Could be Rhonda Beaumont, Barney's girl. She lives in a plush apartment over at 38 Sweetshire Drive, just above the strip. How does she figure? Probably great in a Catalina swimsuit, but in this deal, I'm not sure. She might have put me on the right track by setting me straight about a key to Hummel's apartment that I found next to his body. Wasn't his. A key? Hmm. There, yeah, the design on it, near the top, the round part was like a fancy figure eight. Mean anything to you? Not being a locksmith, no. <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Where can I find Barney Kovac? How would I know? He quit at five today, just like he does every day. And I quit at nine, Marlowe, which happens to be right now. So, goodbye, mister. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. You see, if I work late, Marlowe, I got to pay myself overtime. <laughs> that hurts because I can't afford it. <laughs> see what I mean, boy? <laughs> I was out on the street and behind the wheel of my car before I saw the man in the back seat who had a snub-nosed 38 leveled at my hairline. He looked rugged enough to be no one else but Barney Kovac. Drive, Marlowe. Straight to the corner of Melrose and Orange Drive. I live over a store there, and it's quiet, so we can talk without being disturbed. Come on, drive! Right ahead of you, Marlowe. One with a closed transom. Keep walking. And when I get there? Then you'll go inside, sit down, and rest while you listen. To what? To the truth, Marlowe. I've been following you long enough tonight to know that you're off your rocker. You see, fella, I didn't kill Hummel. Yeah, I know. He's double-jointed. It was suicide. Slugged himself from behind. All right, cut was... it. Here, here's a key. Open up. Okay. Hey, you made a mistake, Kovac. Wrong key. What are you talking about? Let me see that. Sure. With pleasure. <laughs> Stupid. Ah, now that I got your gun, bud, try it yourself. Come on, Kovac. Close quarters make me nervous. You're making a mistake, Marlowe. Yeah, yeah, sure I am. The guys who are off their rocker always do, remember? Now get over there in that chair and behave while I use your phone. Marlowe, don't move or I'll kill you. Hippo. Barney, take the gentleman's gun. It's heavy for him. Mm, sure. Here, now here, boy. Here's some money. Get clear of L.A. till this thing's all cleaned up. You're in a bad spot. I know, but... I didn't kill Hummel, Hippo. you got to believe me. Yeah, by all means. Barney, my boy, if you say it, I believe it. 
But others won't be that accommodating, I'm sure, so go on. And no matter what you do, don't worry about Marlowe. Huh? Nah, he won't be following you. <laughs> you can count on that, Barney. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, programs on a summer Sunday afternoon come to you at home, in your cars, on the beaches, and 101 other places where you are at ease. And for your leisure time listening, what is better than music? Every Sunday afternoon, CBS brings you two outstanding programs of music. Gems from the great composers played by the symphonette. And the sweet, memorable songs of the outstanding modern composers and semi-classicists sung by the choral ears. Each program is designed especially for fine summer Sunday afternoon listening. Hear both the symphonette and the choral ears tomorrow afternoon on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Key Man. gun wrapped in the thick, fat fist of Hippo looked like a toy as he leveled it at my chest while Kovac got away. And the fat boy kicked the door shut, leaned his ponderous 300 pounds against it, and smiled. The smile faded gradually and finally died, but the muzzle of the gun in his hand didn't so much as twitch until the battered alarm clock on the dresser had clanked off a monotonous 15 minutes. At that point, Hippo Link leaved his face up into another smile, waddled across the room, and laid the gun down on the table in front of me. Okay, Marlo, you behaved yourself real nice. Barney's got all the head start he'll need, so you can leave now. You know something, Link? You're not only fat between the sleeves, you're overweight between the ears, too. Helping a suspect escape doesn't sit well at headquarters. Now, now just a minute, boy. You're kind of jumping to conclusions, aren't you? You were putting the muscle on a friend of mine, and I helped him out. That's all that happened so far. So <laughs> You look a little silly running me in on that. But if you still want to try, boy, the... Guns right there on the table. Okay, Hippo, you win for now. But don't think I buy that silly one, two, three story of yours. I may not be Peck's bad boy, but I don't see you as Sir Galahad either. <laughs> well, how do you put the story together then? <laughs> I don't know that that's any of your business, and even if I thought it were, I wouldn't tell you. But I'll let you in on this much. I don't know for sure that Kovac is guilty, but then I don't know for sure where you or Kovac's girl Rhonda Beaumont fit either. Mm, I wouldn't know. You said you knew her. So? You seem to think a good deal of that kid, Kovac. So? So couldn't it be possible she paid you to come up here and see that her boyfriend got away? <laughs> like you said, Marla. I don't know that it's any of your business. <laughs> How much cash does it take for you to stick your neck out as far as you have, huh? Or could it be you've got a thing going for Kovac's girl and would be glad to see him out of town? <laughs> ah, you're kidding, yeah. boy. <laughs> Look, why don't you alone? What's it to you now? My client was knocked off right under my nose, remember? Now, are you going to let me out of solitary? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Pick up your pistol and run. <laughs> and if you need me for any more help, why, be sure and let me know. I left Hippo standing in Kovacs flat, and downstairs I stopped in a phone booth long enough to have the latest developments for what they were worth relayed to Lieutenant Matthews. And I drove out to where Sweets had turned straight up into the hills and parked in front of number 38, the Murrow Apartments. A terraced heap of pastel plaster and angled glass in which Rhonda Beaumont had a first floor front. I took a look at the large private view of the city as I crossed the small private patio and knocked on the substantial private entrance. When it cracked open, I helped it along just enough to step inside. Fast! What in the... Marlo! You will come in, won't you, whether you're asked or not? Yes, and it's sweet of you to ask me, Rhonda. Is, um, uh, is he here? He? Hmm. In a city of four million, half of which are male, that borders on being a stupid question. But the answer is no in any case, because until you strong-armed your way in here, I was alone. I can't buy it. I figure Bonnie's the kind of a boy that would want to take stuff like you right along with him when he leaves. Bonnie leaving? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? He's running away from that mess over on Fountain. He's leaving town. You're lying. I've heard enough uh -uh. from you, Mark. I'll take the handbag, baby. Hmm. Oh, you... Heavy enough to have that cute forty-five caliber compact inside, right? Okay, it's in there. Take it. I don't care. 
But look, Marlowe, is that the truth about Barney leaving town? As if you didn't know, yes. And while we're on that subject, why did you show up at Mark Hummel's place tonight? Well, I went there to warn him about Barney. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you were in love with Kovac. I am. Do I have to draw you a picture? Barney Kovac, strong and reckless, but he was trying hard, awfully hard, to get started for himself, and then... Well, I, I used to go with Mark before I met Barney, and... And because of that, Mark deliberately beat him out of the best deal he'd ever had, the louse. Just to spite me. Well, Barney was furious, and I knew something terrible would happen if they ever got together, so so I went to tell Mark to stay out of his way, that's all. And you got there a little too late, is that it? I don't know. Well, then at least give me a handkerchief out of my bag, Marlo, darn it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Here, I, uh... <laughs> Hey, hey, these keys. Rhonda, this one, the one with the figure eight design, where'd you get it? Oh, it's my new door key. Yeah, I know, but where'd you get it? I don't know. Barney had it made for me one day while we were having lunch. Who's the guy who made it? I don't know. Where were you eating that day? Well, Hungarian place on Fairfax near Santa Monica. Well, where are you going, Marlo? Fairfax near Santa Monica. Here's your bag, Rhonda, and if you got any sense, stay put and try real hard not to shoot anybody. At least until I call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Along, baby. Hey, late extra, the world's in terrible shape, it's a mess, read all about it, late extra papers, it's all over now, paper mister? No thanks kid, tell me something, where's a locksmith on this block? Locksmith? No, there ain't none. Oh come on, sure there is, a guy who makes keys, it's gotta be, think hard, will you? It's important. Think hard, he says, look mister, I know this whole neighborhood like the back of my own hand. No key maker. Uh-huh. Well, how about a guy who sharpens saws, scissors, things like that? No. Nah, nothing like that. Mm. We got uh, filling stations, bars, a delicatessen, drugstore, shoemaker, dry goods store, three restaurants. One's Hungarian. That's on Fairfax. Yeah, mm-hmm. Ace Battery Shop there across Ace the street. A toy shop. store on the corner. A lampshade joint. Shop. Wait a minute. Hold it. Battery. Ace Battery. Plume. Uh, uh, plume. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Old man Plume owns the joint. Uh. A real sour apple, you know what I mean? Place a dump, too, but he works hard. He's probably over there right now, working in the back room. Bless you, my boy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, who is it? Customer, my battery's dead. You gotta help me. Now look, mister, my place is closed up. Come back. (laughs) Hey, what is this? Sorry, Plume, but tomorrow's a long way off. This is an emergency. Now take it easy and you'll be okay. I got a job for you, and it's got to be done tonight. Well, listen, I said my place... Shut should... up! Now, get this, Plume. I'm a friend of Hippo Lynx and Bonnie Kovacs, all of which makes you perfect for my job. Now, what kind of a job are you talking about? This. It's a key. Duplicated. A key? Hey, buddy, this is a battery shop. I can't make keys here. In the first place, you got to have a license... I said this was an emergency, didn't I? Get busy. With what? My fingernails? I don't know how to cut keys. Somebody's stringing you, pal, and I... Bloom, keep away from that drawer! Well, 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 well. Whole drawer full of blank keys, huh? That 38 in the drawer here must be that license you spoke of. Come on, you, get up. Hey, wait, wait, leave me, leave me alone. I, I didn't do anything. Now listen, Plume, I want one straight answer out of you, fast. You made a delivery to Link's Garage sometime today, and it wasn't batteries. Who'd you give it to? Come on! I... I, I left it with Barney Kovac. He was the only one around, but it was nothing, an envelope. Yeah, full of keys. Thanks very much for your help, Plume, but I'm in a hurry. And just so I'll be sure to see you later, good night! I ran out to my car, piled in, and headed straight out Santa Monica for La Cienega. And when I got within sight of the dark cabinet entrance to Hippo Link's underground storage garage, I slowed down and looked for a phone that I could use to call Matthews and still keep an eye on the garage because... The way things stood now, I couldn't afford to miss a lick. But then I got a break. I decided to try a mobile gas station on the corner when the scream of a siren shoved me up against the curb and a squad car swerved out from a side street, ground to a rubber-burning stop in front of the garage and disgorged Matthews himself and the driver on the double. I slammed out of my coupe and belted across the street after him. Matthews! Hey, Matthews! Hello! Hello, get back! Over this way! We get Kovac corner down inside there. You're just... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Matthews, you got this deal all wrong. Oh, no, we haven't. I got two out and back. He's trapped. We'll get him... No, no, no. Right. Hold everything, Matthews. Listen to me. I'm going down there and talk to hey, him. No, I'll no, be no, back no. in a minute. Oh, oh, come back here, fool. Kovac! Kovac, this is Marlowe. Come on out. I got all the answers now, Barney. 
I just had a talk with Plume and I got a lot of truth out of him. Come on, Barney, you're not helping anything. Help! Lalo! Lalo! Phil! Phil, you all right? It's my shoulder, Matthews. Oh, I knew this would happen sometime. Oh. No, this cover. Oh, no, he listen to me. Don't shoot. Oh, Don't. Look at my arm. Uh, listen, Matthews, Kovac didn't do it. What? The shot that got me came from back there on the other side. Yeah, that's it, Pete. Further back. There. There he is, Matthews. That's the boy. That's the fat guy runs this. That's joint. right. Yeah, Hippo Link, second lieutenant. He's your killer. Stop, Link. Stop. I got him, Phil. He's down. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one nice thing about Hippo. You can't... You, you can't miss him. Oh, thanks. I, I... I think I'd better sit down a minute. Hello, Marlowe. You feeling better now? Oh, great, great. Uh, you can't beat these hospital beds for comfort, Lieutenant. <laughs> I'm getting one for my apartment. You can crank it into 30 different positions, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I know. The doc says you got off with a flesh wound. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're pretty lucky, Phil. <laughs> and I just stopped by to tell you they saved Hippo Link, so he'll have to be tried. It won't be much, though. He's already admitted everything. Well, what about Plume? Did you get anything on uh, him? He's still so groggy, I hardly knew his own name when we picked him up. Yeah, it was quite a racket they had, Matthews. Yeah, smooth, smooth. Every rich customer come into Hippo's garage, left his house key with his car keys, was a cinch to be burglarized sooner or later. Yeah, Plume cuts a duplicate key, they find out when the people are away, and that's all they need. Some set up. But sure backfired on him tonight. Hummel went to a lot of trouble to tell Hippo that he was leaving town at seven just to throw Bonnie off his trail. But Hippo took it as a great opening for his racket. So Hummel came home right in the middle of the burglary, and Hippo had to kill him to get out of the way. That's it? Oh, uh, by the way, hmm? a friend of yours out here. Oh? Yeah. I'll get him. Come on in, Barney. He's feeling fine. Oh, swell. Hi, Mr. Marlowe. Hi. I guess Rhonda and I owe you quite a vote of thanks. You owe me nothing but an explanation, Kovac. Why'd you run? Oh, I don't know. Half the way I shot my mouth off about Hummel, I figured I was hooked for sure when he turned up dead. Once I started running, I couldn't stop. Kept getting worse. Yeah, it's exactly what Hippo figured. Yeah, that's one I don't get, Marlowe. Why'd he help me in the first place? He had to, brother. Hippo knew that my best clue was an extra door key. They also knew that Plume had left a bunch of keys with you to give to him. He was sure that if we ever got together and talked about keys, he'd be stuck. Yeah. But as it turned out, I got the same lead anyway from the key Plume made for Rhonda. Uh, hey, Matthews. Yeah. Crack me up in the middle, will you? Uh, what, like this, Phil? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that, perfect. <laughs> Barney, turn off that reading lamp, will you please? Sure. Yeah. Anything else, Marlowe? Uh, yeah, yeah. You see that no visitor sign there? Yeah. Well, just hang it on the door on your way out. <laughs> I'm here for three days, fellas. I'm gonna make the best of them. Good night, all. When they left, I nestled down to the solid comfort of clean sheets and quiet darkness. And my eyes were almost closed. When it happened, the light snapped on. A pair of efficient hands grabbed me, stabbed an inch of hypodermic needle into my right arm, jammed a cold, hard thermometer under my tongue and splashed a half a pint of icy alcohol on my back. Oh, it was awful. But when it was over, she looked back from the door and smiled before she went out. A red-headed nurse and very pretty. (laughs) Only then did I notice the set of keys she'd forgotten on my medicine table. One was thick with a figure eight design. It was her door key. And for just a moment, I wondered foolishly if I could get a hold of Mr. Plume again somewhere. For just a few minutes. <laughs> ah, cut it out, Marlowe. Go to sleep. <laughs> The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Parley Bear, Jack Moyles, Howard McNear, Shep Menken, and Don Oreck. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is written by Richard O'Rant.
Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was going to be a vacation in the wide open spaces, but a black stallion, a tiny emerald, and a battered horseshoe meant a 24-hour delay. It could have been worse, because to the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. Most of us think we are free of tuberculosis. Yet how many of us make sure with periodic chest x-rays that we have no symptoms of this dread disease? Anyone can have TB without being aware of it. In the early stages, there are often no signs. And yet it is in this early stage when it is most important for the disease to be detected. So remember, TB can be cured if you catch it in time. Make an appointment for that chest x-ray immediately. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of the same CBS network stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This time it was going to be a vacation in the wide open spaces, but a black stallion, a tiny emerald, and a battered horseshoe met a 24-hour delay. It could have been worse, because to the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Dude from Manhattan. Every so often, life in the city seems to boil down to nothing but noise and concrete, where all a deep breath does for you is to pack more exhaust fumes into your lungs. And the nearest thing to nature is a mangy sparrow pecking survival out of a dirty alley. So when I got a long-distance call from an old friend inviting me to spend a week in the great outdoors at a ranch he'd just bought near Rattlesnake Mountain, <laughs> I snapped at the chance. Inside an hour, I was rolling down the highway toward San Bernardino. And 120 miles later, at 5 o'clock, I turned in under a big arch of gnarled cedar that spelled out Rainbow Ranch. But the layout beyond was about as primitive as a dry martini. A ranch house the size of a Union Station was backed up by blue tile, swimming pool, paved tennis court, and a semicircle of bungalows with all the rustic charm of a Hollywood motel. I drove on in slowly as a broad-brimmed hat, red gabardine shirt, hickok belt, and hand-tooled boots bounced out the door and ran toward me. It was my host, the ex-hotel man, Harold R. Lawson. Oh, rascal. How are you, boy? I am sure glad you can make it. File out, and I'll show you around. Hey, what is all this, Harold? <laughs> From your phone call, I expected a shack with oil lamps, a wood stove, and at least a few head of cattle. Oh, you mean I didn't tell you? Why, this is a guest ranch, Phil. Guest ranch. The best in the West. Oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and incidentally, don't call me Harold. No, huh? Bad atmosphere for the dudes. The name's Buck now. Buck Lawson. Buck? Oh, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I got a real spread here, Phil. Real spread. Fourteen big cabins, string of thirty horses, stables down there. Hello there, Buck. Oh, hello, Buck. Beautiful day, isn't it? Howdy, folks. Sure is. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Doberman. He's a big fan of storage man in L.A. Oh. As I was saying, I... Thunder! Who's coming? Red Rider? Uh, not funny, Phil. Not funny. Look, it's Thunder. Oh, that black devil. He's loose again. That horse will kick the fence down if those fools don't hold him. Hey, hey, that's some animal. He's a beauty. Yes, and a renegade. A skittish, temperamental bronco with anybody but Virgil Sawyer. Yeah? Oh, they got a rope on him now. That'll hold him, huh? Uh, not for long. Sawyer's the only hand I've got who can get close to that stallion. And he's leaving tomorrow. Blast it. How come? Well... Frankly, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah, Phil. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I came up here for a rest, not a job. I know, I know. You'll get it, Phil. You'll get it. But uh, since you're here, I figure you could sort of keep your eyes open for me. Lawson, it's a dirty trick. No, 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 Phil, please. I'm expecting trouble, and bluntly, I can't afford it. Mm. Every cent I've got is tied up in this ranch. A serious scandal could ruin me. And you're just the one who can keep that sort of okay, thing Okay, okay. So it's the old hotel business on horseback. How does this Sawyer mean trouble? Well... 
There's a couple here from the East, the Mortons. He's a top silk wholesaler from New York and rich. Oh. And that kind means everything to me, Phil. But his wife, Judy, an ex-dance instructor with Arthur Murray back East, is... Well, she's bored stiff out here. And the upshot of it all is that somehow... Mm -hmm. Somehow she and your cowboy Sawyer started making eyes at each other and the husband got nasty about it, huh? How did you know that? Yeah, well, it's standard, like a B-picture plot. Well, anyway, they came to blows this morning. Maybe Virgil's innocent, maybe not, but I can't take a chance, so I fired him. Ordered him to pack and get off the place by tomorrow. Well, that's that. What are you worried about? Plenty. Sawyer's a proud man, Marlo. He, he was furious. He threatened to get even. I'm not sure he means it, but if he does, well, that's what we have to look out for. The we, huh? Now, look, Buck, you built me into coming up here, and I got a good notion to wait, turn around... Wait, 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 Hold it, Phil. What's the matter? You see that couple going into cabin number eight? Yeah? That's the couple I'm talking about, the Mortons, Paul and Judy. Cabin eight, huh? But don't tell me. Just let me guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're right, Phil. You've got number seven. Mm. Okay. Yeah, sure. Number seven it is. I'll be seeing you, Buck. I walked up to number seven and waited for the boy to show up with my bag. Then I started to unpack, but stopped when I heard a riot next door. At that point, sprawling Rainbow Ranch was just a horizontal tenement. Nothing more. Well, let me point out a few... Now what are you doing? Shutting the window. Isn't it bad enough to make a fool of yourself in private? You have to make a public scene as well? The voices rattled on for a few minutes, then dwindled off into a long and golden silence that said maybe a peace treaty had been signed. But then a door slammed to number eight, so I peeked out. It was Morton. And from the look on his face, I knew the peace treaty was nothing but an armed truce. I followed him to the big lodge and into the bar, and when he sat down, I took the stool next to him. Well, uh, what'll it be, gentlemen? Scotch and water, no ice. Uh, the same, with ice. Well, Mr. Morton, I guess that brands us as dudes, huh? <laughs> Bourbon's the only drink out west. I wouldn't know, I'm sure. Oh, it's a fact. Uh, hey, that's a handsome ring you got there. And the initials are the same as mine. Those stones are emeralds, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. There's supposed to be four of them. One's missing, I see. Is that an emerald, too? It was. Happens to be my birthstone. Oh, here you are, gentlemen. Oh, fine. Allow me, Mr. Morton. There you are. Oh, thank you, sir. How'd you lose it? Stone, I mean. I don't know. It happened several months ago, and in any case, it's no concern of yours. Now, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon be left alone. Oh, well, that's too bad. Here I was hoping I'd find out all about the silk business. The silk? What do you mean by that? Oh, just conversation. You are in that business, aren't you? Of course, but... Hey, who are you, anyway? Name's Marlowe. And just why are you prying into my personal affairs, Mr. Marlowe? Because I got a little free advice for you. Cool off before you start the kind of fire you can't put out, huh? So that's it. That cowboy saw you. Mm -hmm. Marlowe, now you're getting too personal. I suggest that you mind your own business. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to lose my temper that way. Good night. Yeah, it's bound to be. Charming, isn't he? Well, Mrs. Morton, where'd you come from? I was standing over there watching. My husband has all the social grace of a tarantula. Well, maybe you should have looked closer before you made the leap. Oh, that's the wonderful thing about him. Yeah? You're not apt to like Paul much when you first meet him. But once you get to know him, you hate him. Yeah, I'm not sure that's funny. It's not supposed to be. I've been living with him for six months now. So jealous, it's unbelievable. He wouldn't leave me in New York, oh no. Insisted on dragging me out to this... This dust bowl with running water. Why a ranch, I'll never understand. He doesn't know one end of a horse from another. Well, with his aptitude, he'll learn. <laughs> you know, it might be, he figured you two might get back together if you had a chance to relax in the open, Mrs. Morton. Mm-hmm. So he said. However, we weren't here ten minutes before he accused me of getting romantic with that leather-faced cowboy. Does that make sense? I don't know. Both gentlemen are justified. You're lovely to look at. Somebody ought to remind my husband. <laughs> His idea of welding a marriage is to spend all his time playing gin with that Doverman. Who? Doverman, the van and storage character from Los Angeles. Oh. Which, of course, leaves me saddled with his wife, Carrie. Now, there's a cute personality for you if you happen to like neurotic parrots. So, what with the desert, the dame, and gin rummy, Virgil began to look pretty good, is that it? Excuse me, folks. Uh, care to order another drink before yes, dinner? Yes, I would. And I'd like it over there, alone. Make it Manhattan, bartender. Strictly Manhattan. And make it double. Mr. Marlowe, good night. Hmm. No, I'm not so sure. It 
was almost dark when I left the bar and headed down to the bunkhouse where the working personnel of Rainbow Ranch called home. The casual clutter of rumpled cots, scattered pulp fiction, and dusty boots gave it the only sign of authenticity I'd seen in the entire place. But aside from that, it was empty. Then a noise from outside brought me around the building to the back, where I ran up against six and a half lean feet of solitary cowboy, with his hat shoved back on his head, pitching horseshoes. <laughs> he was out of uniform for a flashy dude wrangler, which left him in a faded blue shirt and Levi's that fitted his lanky legs like a pair of bent stovepipes. He spotted me and stood there swinging a battered horseshoe in each hand while I walked up to him. Hello. Hiya, Sawyer. A little dark for horseshoes, isn't it? A little. Hey, hey, you're good. <laughs> good at horses, too, huh? I understand you're the only man who can handle that black stallion, Thunder. Yeah. What's the secret? No secret. Just have to treat them right. What's on your mind, mister? The fact that you're leaving tomorrow. I reckon you better keep out of my business. Uh, now, look, Sawyer, it takes at least two to make a fight. And fights are poison to Buck Lawson. So? I don't like to see my friends poisoned. Now, uh, why don't you take it easy, huh? Lay off. Keep your nose clean. I don't know who you are, mister, but I'll tell you this anyway, seeing as you're so interested. I'm leaving here tomorrow, all right. And I'm going to square up with a couple of folks first before I go. I got a raw deal here, and I'm just not the kind to take it laying down. What do you mean, raw deal? You're a big boy now. You ought to know better than to get yourself all involved. I'm not much for conversation, fella, but I'm going to say something real plain so you'll be sure to sell me. Oh! By the time I got myself untangled and back on my feet, the strong, silent fugitive from the old Chisholm Trail was gone. However, my original theory that it takes two to make a fight was still valid. So I decided to find Paul Morton and spend the rest of the evening close to him. His cabin was dark, but I remembered the running gin game he had with the big van and storage man. So I went down the line to the Doverman cabin and knocked. It was Carrie, the perennial dude, who galloped up to open the door. Howdy, stranger. Come on in and set a spell. Our latch is always stringing out. Well, I sure do. Thank you, ma'am. My name's Marlowe. Orville, this is Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Howdy, Marlowe. Howdy. Hope you'll excuse the looks of the place. Our box of extra clothes just arrived from town. Carrie's been unpacking it. Sit down there, Mr. Marlowe. They're mostly old things. Just throw them on the floor. Oh, thanks. But really, I can't stay. I'm looking for Paul Morton. I thought I might find him here. Morton? Say, there's a nice chap. Met, met him day before yesterday for the first time. And won $90 off him in gin already. Haven't seen him tonight, though. Orville was out looking for him himself just a few minutes ago. Weren't you, dear? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, I was. You didn't locate him, huh? No, I didn't. You know, he seemed to be all upset this afternoon. Couldn't keep his mind on the game. I thought I'd have a little chat with him to calm him down some. Orville's a whiz at that, Mr. Mark. Oh, oh it's not me, Carrie. It's this country. I don't see how a man can keep trouble in his mind on a place like this ranch, Marlow. Yeah, it can happen, believe me. Poppycock, why, son, there's something about this open land round here that cleans out a man's head and his heart, too. You sound like a travelogue. I mean it. A few more days of this and mortal forget there ever was such a thing as a cash register. Yes, sir, give this untamed countryside a chance and it'll cure anything. Oh. Yes, well... Oh, no, come here, quick! What was that? Wasn't the call of the wild, Mr. Doberman. Lawson, what's the matter? Bill, come on, down to the stable, hurry! Something terrible's happened! <laughs> How'd you find out about it, Lawson? One of the boys told me. Heard thunder raising a terrible fuss. Come over to check, but by then it was all over. Mm. Give me the lantern, Harold, will you? Here you are, here you are. Holy smoke. It's Paul Morton, all right. He's been trampled to death. Oh, it's a ghastly accident. And it's all my fault, Phil. I, I knew thunder was dangerous, and I didn't get rid of it. All right, take it easy, take it easy. Well, There's I... a lot of questions to be answered before anybody takes the... Bl hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at this. Here by the gate. Oh, it's just a horseshoe. Stables are full of them, Phil. Yeah, not like this one. Look at it. It's all battered up. Well, all right. It's battered. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Nothing do? yet. It gives me an idea. Because the last time I saw one of these, it was being pitched at an iron stake behind the bunkhouse. What are you getting at? Well, the chances are at least 50-50 that Paul Morton's death was no accident. It was murder. <laughs> Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, perfect musical settings for a Sunday before the 4th will be yours tomorrow afternoon. 
The symphonette, a half hour of fine orchestral music, and the choral airs, a half hour of brilliant vocal music, are regular Sunday afternoon features on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Dude from Manhattan. Paul Morton's death, something worse than an accident. Lawson's mouth fell open and the muscles in his face jerked as his eyes moved slowly from me out to the now quiet black stallion in the corral who somehow or other seemed to sense the death at our feet. Then as the trembling man's lips silently formed the word murder, he gestured for me to help him carry Morton's body out of the stable. After that, he looked at the dead man's broken face once more, said he was going to call the sheriff's office and hurried away. A minute later, Judy Morton stepped into the small circle of light that surrounded what only a short time ago had been her husband except for a thin line of perspiration above her lips. She was no different than when I'd seen her last. I just passed Buck on my way down here. Told me my husband was dead. You tell you anything else, Judy? About how Paul died, I mean? No. It was a stallion, wasn't it? An accident? I doubt it. Why, Marlo? Well, one thing, this horseshoe, too close to the body. But this is a stable. And this is a horseshoe that's been used exclusively for pitching at a stake in the ground. Here, look at it. And remember, Cowboy Virgil's favorite sport is horseshoes. Besides, what reason would your husband have for coming down here at this hour in the first place? He wasn't too crazy about horses, you know. No, but he was about me. Let's move a little away from here, Marlo. Cigarette? No, thanks. I'm not coming apart at the seams because it isn't in me. I hated Paul. Hated him with all my heart, Marlo. I'm down here only because he pleaded with me, begged me to talk to him once more to listen to reason. About what? About the decision I came to less than an hour ago, which was divorce, unconditionally. I thought you said you came out here to try to patch things up. I did. I also said that we weren't doing a very good job of it. Then, tonight, a little after we left you with the bar, Marlow, I got my hands on the lever I needed to pry myself loose from that jealous maniac. It was the knowledge, Marlow, that my late husband was crooked. So business? Yes. While he was drinking his dinner, I went to one of his suitcases for an aspirin. Found what instead? At least three dozen samples of the best silks made without any importer's or manufacturer's name. And underneath that, $200,000 in cash. I know enough about the silk business to fill in the blanks, Marlowe. Hmm. All of which comes under the heading black market, huh? Yes. I added what I had found to the fact that this dude ranch he had insisted on was close to Los Angeles. Close enough for him to run off and conduct his purchasing while I thought he was communing with nature or playing gin with that Mr. Doverman. Then I had him. Mm-hmm. You also had a divorce, no strings attached, right? Exactly. Blackmail to get rid of your own husband. <laughs> Pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Well, at least with this this accident or whatever it is, it's no longer necessary. No. Now, Judy, only two things are necessary. One, the location of Virgil Sawyer, and the other, you and your own cabin, where I can ask you some questions later. Why do you want to ask me questions? Well, I might be making a big mistake, baby. But it might be that Virgil and you are out for the 200,000 bucks. You know, honey, that man in the saddle might like money, too. I'll see you. When I started back for the bunkhouse, the only place I knew of that might give me a lead on the strong, silent horseshoe pitcher, I realized that tagging Paul Morton's death or murder was one thing. Proving it was going to be quite another. And when I was there and the place was empty without even signs of a hasty departure, I was sure of it. But not by intuition, as was the gentleman standing in the open doorway watching my every move. Orville Doverman, champion of the wide open spaces, didn't believe that a clean-cut cowboy could be guilty of anything more unrefined than spitting on a pot-bellied stove. Well, oh, I think you're crazy. Buck told me about your finding that horseshoe next to Morton's body and the conclusion you jumped to from there. You're being very hasty, boy, and that's dangerous, and that's the reason I'm here. I don't believe in necktie parties. Necktie parties? A man's parties. got a right to hey, a fair trial. Hey, hold it. Can't... Nobody said anything about lynching your hero. Huh? I want to find Sawyer, so that if I'm right, we can save the state the time and trouble of a manhunt. But since you brought it up, vigilante, don't scramble for conclusions too quickly yourself. I happen to have a little more to go on than the relative position of a horseshoe. Not that idle gossip that's going around. The same. But the moment it figures two ways. Virgil's unhappy enough with the status quo to liquidate the city slicker. Or Virgil and the squaw light out after a clean start the hard way. Choose one. Nonsense, Marlowe. In either case, and especially the stupid suggestion that the girl and Virgil Sawyer are in cahoots. That I can't believe. Well, for sentimental reasons I can't either. Besides, Judy Morton found out enough about her husband within the last hour to make murder for freedom's sake very unnecessary. 
She learned he was a crook, Mr. D., if you can stand the disillusionment. Oh, no, no. Yeah, it's in shady dealings in silk. Judy didn't go into details about it, but I gather she found out enough to make him sit up and take notice. And that brings us right back to Virgil. Boots, saddle, and all. Yeah. It does, sort of. And we'll argue the fine points later. But right well, now, Mr. Doverman, if you want to make sure that everybody gets a square deal, get close to Judy's cabin and stay there. Sentry duty, your object. Oh, all right. And if I'm wrong about the cowboy, you've done nothing worse than waste your time. Goodbye. <laughs> I spent the next 20 minutes talking to cowhands, guests, miscellaneous hired men, any and everybody who might have been able to say he went that away of Virgil Sawyer, with no success. And to make matters worse, when I'd given that up and was on my way back to the lodge to help Lawson wait for the sheriff, I found myself being paged, Howdy. Western style, of course, by no one else but oh, Mrs. Gary Howdy. Doverman, the capital D in Dude Ranch. Howdy. Howdy, ma'am. Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah. Miss Marlowe, look at this. Look at what I found. I've struck it rich, you might say. Much like the old rustlers. The old uh, rustlers, Mrs. Doverman, stole cattle. Oh? Yes. Oh, yes, so they did. I, I guess I meant those panhandle men. Mm. You know, gold is where you find it. <laughs> and anyhow, look, it's a precious stone. Small, but nevertheless precious. Uh, uh, mine while digging for worms, no doubt. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you're teasing me. Yes. You know very well that this is a polished stone. Funny thing, though, is where I found it. Shall I tell you? Oh, please. Please do, Mrs. Dover. Well, I was just unpacking those clothes that mm -hmm. Orville has sent up from Los Angeles. Yeah. Some slacks and things like that. And, well, when I started to hang a pair up, this fell out of one of the cups. And then... <laughs> now, I wonder how a little old emerald like this ever got there. Well, it was probably mice, Mrs. Dover. Em emerald? Hey, let me see that quick. Well, yes, of course. But believe me, Mr. Marlowe, it can't be very valuable, I'm sure. I'm not. What are you talking about? Murder, or a reasonable facsimile thereof, and a girl named Judy Morton, if I don't hurry. Goodbye, and bless you, Mrs. Doverman. You talk too much, but now was the right time. As I ran for Judy's cabin, I didn't know any more about the whys and wherefores of Paul Morton's death than I had before I made small talk with Mrs. Doverman. But I did know that unless Lady Named Luck and I were on the same team, the Rainbow Ranch was due for a second corpse. When I was close enough to the rough oak door, numbered eight, and Orville Doverman, whom I'd asked to stand guard, was nowhere in sight. The full impact of that responsibility sank into where the wingtips on the butterflies in my stomachs were scratching at my hip pocket. Until I moved in still closer, and there in the light of a single lamp that was halo enough for me, I saw the girl from Manhattan, nervously lighting one cigarette from the end of another. But more important, very much alive. I didn't bother knocking. Marlowe! What are you doing here? What am I doing here? Honey, I'm uncrossing fingers and toes alike. You know, they've been that way since I realized that I opened my mouth too wide, too soon, which puts you right smack on what used to be known as the spot. Oh, so well, that's the way it happened. Yeah, that's the way it... Now, look, Judy, baby, you can't know what I mean yet. It's Doverman, honey, the gin player with all the moving vans. He's the one your husband was buying that black market silk from. I didn't know that until a few minutes ago, which was after I told him where you could be found and that you knew an awful lot. Oh, which, yeah. Mr. Marlowe, he thanks you and warns you not to move. Yo. Yeah, oh. See what I mean, Phil? Yo, yeah, oh, sure, I see. You know, it's funny, Doverman, when I was outside and didn't see you around, or did see that Judy here was still in good health, I figured that either you had decided to sit tight until you knew exactly how much she did know or that you already started to run. Yeah, this I didn't count on. And this, Marlowe, should point up what I said earlier about your jumping to conclusions. It's dangerous. Handling hot silk is child's play. Huh? It has been for me for 20 years, Marlowe. For your husband, Mrs. Morton, it was much more. That's why I had to come to you like this. That's why I had to know if his stupidity went so far that even you knew of me. You shouldn't have bothered Mr. Doverman. I didn't. No, but you see, Marlowe did. That leaves me even. Uh, correction, Doverman. Paul Morton's dead. You're out in front. I didn't kill Morton, Marlowe, and neither did Virgil Sawyer. I saw it all, my friend. So I can tell you that the man who killed Paul Morton was Paul Morton himself. Suicide? Are you out of your mind? No, not suicide, Mrs. Morton. Merely a plan for murder that backfired. The intended victim was you, his wife. Oh, no. Keep talking, Doverman. <laughs> Why, Marlowe? I'd rather keep you guessing. I wouldn't. Duck, baby! Oh! My shoulder! Now the man said keep talking. I, 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 I can't. I'm hit. You'll be again if you don't. Sorry, you know. Stay out of this, Marlow. Come on, Doverman. I'm not going to ask you again. Well, look, I'm not even going to let you fall until you tell the rest. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll tell you. I overheard Morton ask him. So I'm go to your place first, Sawyer. Pick up one of your horseshoes. And then he went to the stables near the black stallion's stall. The horseshoe in his hat... 
Don't saw you my shoulder. Come on, Doberman, you're not finished yet. Well, I, I figured that he was going to... To knock his wife out, leave Sawyer's horseshoe where it'll be found, then half make it look like an accident that would fool nobody, huh? What went wrong, Doberman? Why didn't it work? Well, he, he approached Thunder from the right side instead of the left. The horse got excited, kicked out, and caught him. That dude. Now, let go, Sawyer. Sure, Doberman. With pleasure. It was a slow but steady two hours of first aid and questions and answers mixed with a San Bernardino deputy sheriff who couldn't quite get over it before Orville Doberman was on his way to a hospital that featured barred windows. Mrs. Doberman, a complete innocent, was on her way back to Los Angeles. And Buck Lawson, Judy, and I were in the bunkhouse. Watching Virgil Sawyer watch a pot full of water boil for coffee. Ranch style. Well, you know, you can't ever tell, Marlo. This whole thing might have just the right effect. Oh. Put the ranch on the map, I mean. <laughs> After all, it was a genuine 100% cowboy who saved the day for us. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, that's not right, Buck. Huh? It was Marlo here. I only followed him. Coffee's ready, folks. Oh, yeah, that's good, for me. Good. Let's go. What uh, <laughs> did make you go up there, Mr. Marlowe? Oh, a little precious stone, Virgil. An emerald that once fell out of Paul Morton's initial ring. But, Marlo, that happened a long time ago, three, four months. It was just after Paul had returned to uh, New York from Los Angeles. Yeah, and negotiations with Doveman. You see, honey, it was Mrs. Doveman, really, who found the missing emerald tonight and a pair of slacks that Orville had sent up here. Then that was proof that Paul must have been with Doveman in Los Angeles before. Yet they claim to have met for the first time here at the ranch. Uh, yeah, that's what they claimed. That plus what you told me, Judy, made the man with the moving vans it. And, uh, you, oh, hey, Virgil, that coffee's hot. Uh, but it's good. <laughs> well, anyway, since I told Doverman where you were and that you knew your husband had been dealing in black market silks, he took his cue accordingly. Yes, and fortunately, you yours. Well, that makes it two people who tried to kill me tonight. My husband and his partner. Seldom is heard a discouraging word. Oh, fine. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Good night, gentlemen. Virgil Sawyer made good coffee and lots of it. So another hour went by before we finally broke up and I was outside smoking a cigarette and strolling toward my cabin in the start of a vacation that already had been postponed too long. But halfway there, I stopped at the sound of raised voices ahead of me. A man and a woman were arguing violently. And a little away from them, on the porch of my cabin, watching the battle of the sexes with consternation while he waited for me, was Buck Lawson, mine host. <laughs> I turned quickly and hurried back to the bunkhouse where I knew Virgil Sawyer would put me up for the night. Where I knew that early the next morning, I could sneak off, find a quiet, cool stream, and fish. A coyote high in the hill someplace said I had the right idea. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Bill Johnstone, Bill Lally, Herb Butterfield, D.J. Thompson, Lou Krugman, and Jack Carrington. The special music is written by Richard O'Runt. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I went from a mansion in Bel Air to a cheap flat in Southgate, looking for a girl with a secret, who a man in a pork pie had a wise cracking secretary and a fat corpse didn't want me to find, but who I found anyway because of the quiet number. <laughs> Three high
highly individual, highly entertaining mystery adventure shows stand high among the top shows on CBS every Sunday. The Green Llama, Call the Police, Sam Spade. Go adventuring with them every Sunday when they come to you over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This one began with a bedlam and got worse as I bumped into a burglar, a bookie, a Boswell, and a body and a big shot named B. And before it was all over, everyone had lost his head because the headless peacock had moved. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Headless Peacock. The day had been eight noisy hours of international complications, local vintage. That it started when a Frenchman from Beverly Hills who spoke no English hired me to find the Filipino houseboy he thought had stolen the family silverware to sell to a prosperous downtown Chinese. However, it had played differently since the Frenchman had been wrong all the way. And both the houseboy and the silverware had turned up in the cool of his own basement, where the servant had gone to do his polishing and comfort. Which was hardly the end of things, because even now, as I slumped behind the desk in my office exhausted, the accused Chinese, who was highly insulted was on hand together with a nasty pet terrier tucked underneath his arm to tell me all about it. And just to top that off, the door was suddenly flung open and Bedlam really set in because the new arrival, who was maybe 28 with green eyes and sparkled in an almost pretty face, was also a redhead with demeanor to match. And it was obvious that one, she wanted to hire me, two, she was in a hurry, and more important, she really... Uh, she, uh, Hey! Just a minute! Hold it, both of you. Now, Mr. Tang, I've had enough. Here on your way out, take this. It's the Frenchman's address in Beverly Hills. The mistake was his. See him. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> Thanks, honey. It was going to be me or that windbag with Terry any minute. What can I do for you? Plenty and all of it in a hurry. Sit down and listen hard, will you, Marlowe? My name is Dennis. Front part, Artie. Oh, which is short for what? The whole thing. It's really Ruth Dennis. R.D., see? Oh, that's cute. R.D., Artie. Yeah, what's the problem? It's a guy I love, Marlowe. He's tall, blonde, and his name is Gordon Holzer, and he sells shoes. But don't mm. laugh, because when he connects, he does it by the carload. Mm. Also, I figure he loves me, and at the moment, is in lots of trouble. Why? Because when I came in on the train late this afternoon, Gordon wasn't on hand with the usual brass band. He wasn't at my apartment, either. But a note was. Said he had to work late at the office. I waited an hour and then gave him a ring. They told me he wasn't in, hadn't been, for two days. Next, I called his home. He has a bungalow up on Vista Del Mar. 7700 North. Mm-hmm. And when you got no answer, you started to worry, huh? Yeah, so I went up there. Gordon, of course, wasn't around, but somebody else was. Somebody small on the natty side, with no more eyebrows than a goldfish. He belonged to a new sedan, long and black. Did you talk to him? Oh, better than that, we wrestled. Have you got a cigarette? Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Thanks. It's all right. See, Marlo... This guy was snooping around the place, so I decided to find out a few things. I made believe I had a gun in my pocket, and I told him to put his hands up. Oh, fine. Well, it worked for a while. Which brings us to the wrestling. Huh? Yes. When I mentioned Gordon's name, he knocked me down. But he wasn't very big, so I managed to hit him once with my bag before he got away. Also, I ripped his coat pocket open. And here, this fell out. The newspaper clipping. A picture of a fat hunk of jewelry that was once stolen from someone named Isaac B. Stolen from Isaac who? B is in bzzz. Oh. Look, it's a peacock with the head broken off. But with a tail that's loaded with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. What does it mean? What is it? Marlo, that's the reason I'm here. I don't know. Hmm. You'll turn the clipping over. You'll see that the theft must have happened quite a while ago because the ad on the back features a Christmas special. 
Tell me, you figure that Gordon stole this from Mr. B? Uh, well, no, I, I don't. Well, then why'd you come to me instead of the police? Well, You I... what? Come on, Artie, let's have it all, huh? Okay. That's better. I don't suppose it's smart not to tell you anyway. Gordon isn't all shoe salesman. He's part lunatic when it comes to the horses. You know, the right pony a day keeps the doctor's bills away. I thought I'd cured him. Now I'm less than sure. So you figured that maybe he got in too deep while you didn't know about it, and now he's trying to even things up by playing with stolen property, is that it? I hope not. But even if it is, I still want to help him. Now here, here's a hundred dollars, Marl. Do you go to work for me, yes or no? Yes, on one condition. All right, what? If I find out the facts and pass them on to you, until and if he turns up crooked, and I drop it, agreed? Agreed. <laughs> The lady left, and in that hour that followed, I was on my own in the files of the Hollywood Times. I learned that Isaac B. was a 70-year-old eccentric with curly hair, a bulbous nose, no chin, a million dollars, and a mansion on West Adams Boulevard. He had a Napoleonic complex and was a great philanthropist, as long as the grant in question would perpetuate the name of Isaac B. About the headless peacock, I learned little except that it had never been recovered and that the gems in the tail were of an unusual cut and would be hard to peddle. So it was 8.30 when I finally dropped the oversized bronze knocker monogrammed I.B., after which a man about 40 with a sallow complexion and a voice as delicate as spun glass opened the door halfway. Uh, yes, sir? I'd like to see Mr. Isaac B., please. Name's Marlowe. And your business? Personal. I'm a private detective. And you? Me? Why, I... I'm Everett Ransom. I'm Mr. B.'s biographer, but also, Mr. Marlowe, I act as his aide. Now, if it's about money for some cause, you'll have to follow the usual channels and write to you Mr. B. You can stop right there, Boswell. I'm not after money, just information. About what? A piece of jewelry that was stolen from Mr. B., a headless peacock. The peacock? You know of its whereabouts. I didn't say that. Now, do I see Mr. B. or no? You, you, young man, open up, Ransom. Bless him uh, Yes, sir. We'll sit over here in the foyer. How cozy. Thank you, Ransom. Mr. B., my name is Philip Marlowe. Yes, 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 I heard. The private detective, the peacock and all that. Well, what do you have to say? Not very much. I understand the peacock was stolen from you some months ago. Why, huh? yes. Yes, shortly before Christmas. It was one of Mr. B.'s favorites, priceless as both a museum piece and for the $100,000 worth of we jewels We all know that, Ransom. Yes, sir. Shall I, uh, shall I go now, sir? No. That busted me for the Young People's Club. I want you to take it with you before you leave tonight. I'll show you the inscription change I want made the first thing in the morning. You can keep it in your apartment until then. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, Marlowe, get to the point. Quickly, please. All right. Mr. B., a client of mine... Whose uh, name is what? Miss Ruth Dennis, if it matters, is worried about a boyfriend. Which concerns uh, Peacock in what way? I don't know. Unless you can tell me something about a natty little man who's short on eyebrows. Eh? When last seen, he was carrying a newspaper picture of the bird. Mean anything? No, no, no. Is that all you know about the theft, Mr. Marlowe? Just about. That and the name Gordon Holzer and a bungalow on Vista Del Mar near uh, Franklin. Holzer, Holzer, bungalow. What are you talking about, Marlowe? Shots in the dark, Mr. B. Oh, shots. When they miss, they miss a mile. Good night, sir. Outside in my car as I started away from the curb, I glanced into the rearview mirror and saw the reflection of a sedan that was also just beginning to move. A sedan that was both very long and very black. I kept to the quiet streets and stayed under 30 until I'd gone about two miles, and then, at the next intersection, a busy one, I made my move, which was a sudden spurt of the thick traffic via a wide left turn that produced screeching tires and uh, frank opinions. You stupid jerk! I swung around the block once, made it back onto the quiet street just in time to catch sight of the sedan going by fast. I followed it, and 20 minutes later, when it broke to a stop in Beverly Hills in front of a hat shop marked Lester's, I did the same. I piled out of my car and walked quickly toward what I thought would be the natty man without eyebrows. But when the door of the sedan opened, it was a woman, blonde and beautiful, who ran to the door of the shop, unlocked it, and hurried inside to where a telephone was ringing. There was an alley beside the building, and I ran back to where I could see inside. There were five telephones side by side in a phony front cabinet that spelled Bookie. And on the wall above a publicity picture of a natty man without eyebrows, sitting in the middle of a bunch of zany Why, hats, no. No, Mr. Holzer, beautiful blonde was talking on one of the all, telephones. Sir. And when Mr. I moved Lester closer, I was happy to hear her address the party at the other end of the line as none other than Gordon Holzer. Uh -huh. He's on his way up there now. Well, where are you? Oh, returning home. That's fine. Key still in the mailbox? Good. 
Of course, Mr. Holzer, you decided to pay that 15000 for sure this time, haven't you? You know, Mr. Lester wouldn't want you to disappoint him. I yet. moved out of the alley quietly and went back. Entered the shop through the front door, which was still open. Beautiful blonde was just hanging up the phone when I stepped into the light. What? Good evening. Who are you? What do you want here? A new hat. Something chick, chick. Any suggestions? Yeah. Get out of here. This shop is closed for business. Bedding included? Be- Why, sir, there must be some mistake. This is a hat shop. With five hidden telephones and a boss man who collects pictures of headless peacocks for well, a hobby? I... Sorry, baby, I don't buy it. Not even as a conversation piece. So shall we start all over again, huh, baby? Well, <laughs> yes. Why don't we? And with this to keep us from changing the subject. A heavy service forty-five, honey. Looks a little bulky in that dainty hand, don't you think? It'll look worse when it explodes in your face. Now, who are you? By name, Philip Marlowe. By occupation? A private detective. And just to keep the interview rolling, I sleep in pajamas, tops and bottoms alike. Love Chinese Stay cooking, back. pressed almond don't duck come in particular. Closer. And don't, don't you prefer take blondes. Step Give me that. Get out. <laughs> you big bum. I don't know why I didn't shoot. I do. But lest we lose the question and answer period, your turn. Name. Patience. Oh, no. <laughs> What's the rest of it? Hancock. A very fine Virginia name, Mr. Marlowe. Anything else? Uh, yeah, there is. What's your connection with Mr. Lester, Gordon Holzer, and the Headless Peacock? If it's any of your concern, I happen to be Mr. Lester's business associate. But believe me, when he gets back from Pasadena, he... <gasps> oh, I'm... I'm you mean in... just what you said. The man I'm looking for is in Pasadena. Don't look. Thank you, honey child. The interview's now closed because as of this minute, I'm off to the home of the Rose Bowl. Good night, patience. I was going to Pasadena like Patience Hancock was going to join the campfire girls. But as long as the little Virginian wanted it that way, I couldn't see any reason not to play ball. So after I called my client and brought her up to date, blow by blow, I headed for 7700 North Vista Del Mar in what I figured was a business transaction. Headless Peacock included. I parked away from the place which was cedar shingles under healthy ivy and a single lamp at work in the living room. Then I walked up to where I could see that a man, blonde, tall, and alone, in hat, coat, and frightened face, was about to leave. When the door opened, I took that as my cue to switch 38 from shoulder holster and announce myself. Well, what do you want with me? Words, Mr. Holzer, lots of them. You see, I work for a... Oh, Mr. Holzer... That man on the floor there behind you, that natty little man without eyebrows, seems quite still as and shot to death. It, he is. But I didn't do it. Honest, I didn't. Now, let me out of here. I gotta go. Start running? Come on, Holtz. I'm not all champ. Get back inside. Well, all right. But I can explain this. Oh, sure. Sure, it's easy. Like one, you lost too much money playing the horses through this dead bookie here who used to double as a milliner. Boy. And two, to square yourself with him, you got mixed up with 100,000 bucks worth of headless peacock. All right. And three... Mr. Holzer, as of just now, you had an appointment with said milliner, which body on the floor here says got out of hand. Do you care to add anything? Like how you got the peacock away from Isaac B. and what took you so long getting around to peddling it? I don't know any Isaac B., nor did I... Nor did you what? Outside the window. Somebody's moving. Yeah, somebody with a gun. Duck holds it. It's going to be like... I'm going to shoot! <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Sunday afternoon, a perfect time for music. Sunday afternoon, the time of the week when almost everyone takes time for relaxation. Combine Sunday afternoon with music and relaxation, and you have the Symphonette and the Coral Ears, two outstanding CBS musical programs. Most of these same CBS network stations bring you both programs every Sunday. Relax and enjoy them tomorrow. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Headless Peacock. It had come one, two, three. A corpse on the floor, shots through the window, and Gordon holds her out the back door while bullets made lights out. And Marlowe on the floor, the smart move. It made this the time to call the law, so in case the character with a gun was still hanging around outside. I left the lights off, fumbled my way to the phone, and dialed 116 in the dark. 
A minute later, I had Detective Lieutenant Matthews on the wire. So you got a corpse, huh, Marlowe? Uh, <clears throat> give it to me again, will you? Who, where, and why? A guy named Lester, supposed to be a hat designer in Beverly Hills, but stacks up better as a bookie. He was shot to death here at 7700 Vista Del Mar. Whose place is that? Uh, one Gordon Holsey. He has his name on the mailbox. Hey, got a motive, Marlowe? Well, it's a theory. Could be that Lester put on too much pressure trying to collect 15 grand holes or owed him from bad bets on the ponies. There's more, but it'll keep till you get here, Lieutenant. Uh, okay, Marlo. A couple of the boys on their way now. Mm-hmm. I'll be over myself later. Stick around, will you? Yeah, okay. Goodbye. Marlo, you promised me you wouldn't call in the police, but I heard enough to know you just finished talking to them. Didn't you, you two-faced cheat? You bet I did, cutie. What's more, when you hired I'm me... I'm not I... through. I want to know something else. What are you doing here in the dark, and where is Gordon? All right. That order, first the lights are out to keep me from being shot in the back. And second, your boyfriend Holzer left on a double because I was about to find out why Lester's body is here on Holzer's living room floor. Lester's body? You heard me. You, you mean that little man is in here? Dead? Very much so. And, and don't burn yourself out on that shock surprise routine. Marlowe, I swear, I... Okay, turn on a light and show me. Where is this corpse, if any? Baby, don't forget the last time lights were on in here, the room felt like the receding end of a shooting gallery. I didn't see any firing line when I came in. Yeah, that's a point. But there are two ways of looking at it. Will you turn on a light, or will I? Okay, okay, we'll play it your way. Yeah, take a good look. Oh, Marlowe, it's him all right. Same little man. Artie... You knew I was coming over here. You knew the setup, and I was close to winning an argument with Holzer when somebody broke it up by shooting through that window straight enough not to hit anything, even though Holzer was a perfect target. Add it up for yourself, baby. Oh, it wasn't me, Marlowe. Please believe me. You do, don't you? Let's look in this bag of yours first, Artie. <laughs> Give me that. In a minute. Well, oh, that's one thing in your favor. No gun. Could have dropped it in the shrubbery on your way to the door, of course. Here's what I really want anyway. My keys? What do you want them for? I'll tell you later. Well, that's the boys in blue and just in time. Yeah, you louse. In time for what? To hold on to you as a material witness. But... Uh, I've got work to do, and I want to get it done without you screaming at me all the way. Oh, I wish I'd never hired you. I wish I'd never heard of and you. And another thing, if you're playing me for a patsy, kid, that's only the beginning. You'll need a deep well full of wishes before it's over, so come on, behave yourself. told the two prowl car cops no more than I'd already told Lieutenant Matthews, except that Artie should be held because she was Holzer's girl. That plus the small lie that I'd cleared with the lieutenant to leave as soon as help showed, and I was out the door, into my own car, and pointed toward Artie's place, which was on Tamarin. I figured there was a good chance Holzer would head there first, and if I moved fast, I might catch up with him before the police did. Artie's place was dark, which could mean anything under the circumstances, so I dug in my pocket for the keys I'd taken from a purse started for a door when footsteps behind me changed my mind. Oh, Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, say this is a stroke of good luck finding you here. That depends. How'd you manage it, Mr. Ransom? Why, Mr. Beers had me trying to locate you since about an hour after your interview this evening. I checked everywhere and finally looked up your client's name in the phone book, got this address, and, uh, well, here you are. Yeah, yes, I know. Why have you been after me? What's all the excitement? And make it fast. I'm in a hurry. Hey, yes. You see, your call this evening intrigued Mr. B and me very much. And after you left, we naturally began discussing the theft of the peacock again. Naturally? Look, Ransom, get to some point, will you? I got things to do. Oh, certainly, Mr. Marlowe. Well, sir, the point is that in going over in our minds the days preceding the theft, we both recall a man named Holzer or, or Holter or something very close to that. Mm-hmm. He came to the house one day claiming to represent a certain philanthropy. He, um, he was a fake, of course, and we never saw him again, but it was less than a week later that we discovered the peacock was gone. Stolen. What this man look like, you remember? Well, I most assuredly do. He was bald, about 50, and fat. No, no, it couldn't possibly be the same man. Oh. Oh, you found Mr. Holzer then? Once, briefly, uh, yeah. Now, there's no resemblance. Oh, I see. Well, I... I don't know how I'm going to break the news to Mr. B. He's upset all over again. I... I can't tell you how much that headless peacock means to him. Try saying a hundred thousand bucks. And Mr. Marlowe, have you run across anything else tonight other than that newspaper clipping that would seem to be connected with the pin in any way? I, um... I can arrange a reward, you know. No, nothing. I'm sorry. Well, good night, Mr. Ransom. If anything comes up about headless peacocks, I'll call you as soon as... as. What is it? What did you find? A note stuck in the door. Oh, maybe I should... No, no, Mr. no. No, I can handle it, really. Dearest Dottie, I didn't realize how fast things got out of hand. I must have lost my mind. 
I'm going to undo all the wrong I've done, and I'm getting out. Love, Gordon. So, yes, I should have listened to a smart girl in the first place. What? Why, Miss Kamala, the fellow sounds desperate. He's got a right to. That natty little man I mentioned earlier tonight is dead. <gasps> murdered. Oh, great Scott. But, but then, Mr. Marlowe, then how can this man possibly undo all the wrong he's done, as he says in that note? That beats me. But one thing is sure. This hands my little client a nice, clean slate, which makes my next stop the police. I'll see you, Mr. Ransom, and happy peacock hunting. I got in my car and drove back the way I'd come to Gordon Holzer's house on Vista Del Mar. The prowl car was gone, but Lieutenant Matthew's sedan was angled in against the curb, the red spotlight still on. I parked and went in. The lieutenant, his hands jammed down in his pocket, stood with two other plain clothes men near the shattered window, while a photographer worked over the corpse on the floor. Artie was nowhere in sight. Matthew spotted me as soon as I walked in and bore down on me with all the frivolity of a heavy cruiser. Marlowe, I thought I asked you to stick around. Yeah, yeah, you did. But I got an idea that wouldn't keep. Eh? Yeah. Did it prove anything? Not for sure. Where's the girl? Which one? You mean there's more? Oh, yeah. That red-headed fireball, Artie Dennis, you already know about. Yeah. The other one is a southern belle named Patience Hancock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Belong to <laughs> Lester. Yeah. Caught her snooping around outside trying to find out what had happened to him, and when we gave her the word, she blew her top. Mm. I got both of them locked up. Good. Oh, Say, did you get any facts out of Patience? Yeah, plenty. No? Oh, uh, your bookie theory was right, Marlowe. Thank you. Yeah. All we got to do now is find Holzer, wrap this up. Yeah, I'm not sure it's as simple as that, Lieutenant, listen, but it's the next step anyway. Come on, let's take a look out back, huh? When he left here, that's the way he ran. I already looked. It's a blank. Oh, really? It's a door that leads out to the alley. Mm. Here, this way. All right. And you see? Nothing. Mm. Must have beat it through here and out to the street. You wouldn't happen to know where... Now, what's the matter, Marla? What are you staring at? Hmm? Oh, that, uh, that window there in the house right across the alley. Yeah. See the one with the lights on and the shade drawn? Oh, yeah. Some old geezer sitting in there. So what about it? The silhouette of his head on the shade, Matthews. Yeah? I won't forget that profile as long as I live. Corduroy hair and a light bulb nose. That is Isaac B. in that room, or... Holy smoke, wait a minute. Hey, what are you doing? Put the gun away! What's the idea? You're crazy? You're shot down on the ground. Yeah, yeah, and the old guy in there didn't bat an eye. Didn't even turn his head at the sound. That gives me a big idea, and we're going to check something fast. Come on! We ran back inside, and as I picked up the phone, Matthews found out for me that the house across the alley faced on Common Avenue. Then I dialed Isaac B.'s home number, and when I finally got a sleepy hello, I asked him a question. The answer he gave boosted the odds on my hunch into the sure thing class. When I hung up, Matthews unhappily agreed to play along, and with one of the plain clothes men, went around to Common Avenue to cover the front of the house across the alley. Well, I went out to the back way again, 38 in hand, crossed the alley, climbed up on a brick wall, and moved toward the window. It was 18 inches open. I eased one edge of the blind aside and looked in. A life-size bronze bust of Isaac B. I've heard mentioned earlier sat on a table in front of the window. And beyond that was Gordon Holzer, backed against the wall and staring in stiff fear at a pistol clenched in the hand of the biographer, Everett oh, Ransom. Don't shoot. I, I made a mistake, I admit it. You certainly did, Mr. Holzer. A much greater one than you realize. But I want to return this now. I've brought the peacock back to you. Don't you understand? Yes. Yes, but I'm afraid you don't. I got careless a few weeks ago and left the shade up one night when I took the peacock out of hiding to admire it. And you watched the whole thing from your dark bedroom window, which is directly across the alley, didn't you? Yes, I, I knew it must be valuable. When I got in the jam yesterday, I broke in here and stole it. But I'm sorry, and that's why I brought it back. And now... But don't I... move. Don't move, Mr. Holter. You see, two facts must never be revealed. One, that I stole the headless peacock from Isaac B. a year ago. And two, a little matter of murder. You killed Lester? Yes, I killed Lester. I waited for you to come home. And when that Lester showed up and went into your house, I mistook him for you. He was a very nosy little man. I had to kill him. You shot through my window so I could get away from Marlowe. Because you couldn't afford to let me talk to him. In fact, you can't let me talk to anybody. Ever. That's right, Mr. Holt. Luckily, I found out you'd be coming here to my place to return the peacock. Because I was with Marlowe when he found your note to that girl. He knows a lot about this, Marlowe does. But by the time I'm through, neither he nor anyone else will be able to figure out what really well, look, happened. I'll go away. I'll no. Go. No, Mr. Holzer, it's too late. This way. 
I'll have to restore that gorgeous thing to Mr. B. But I'll be something of a hero for catching the thief and the murderer. I'm sorry, Mr. Holter. But after all, you did bring this on yourself. You're quite a moralist, aren't you, Ransom? Moral? How does you... Get back, Holter. Get out of the way. Drop it, Ransom. Turn loose of the gun. Oh, you, Ransom. Come on. Drop it. Nice going, Holzer. He's out. And I've... I've got his gun, Marlowe. Yeah. Here it is. I'm going to stand real still. Talk real quietly from now on out. Good enough, Marlowe? Not quite, but it'll help. From what I've seen of Artie Dennis, brother, you're going to be a lifer anyway, but not with the state. Hey. Hey, it's cold out here. Come on, give me a hand. for getting me out of the pokey, Mr. Marlowe. You rat. No, I figure it's safe to turn you loose now, Artie. Uh-huh. <laughs> Gordon's going to have to stay in here a while, I guess. That's right. But that won't be so bad. At least he'll be where no horses or women can bother him till I can get to him again. Won't be for long. He's got a lot in his favor, you know. I hope so. I still don't understand how it all worked out. I was in jail, remember? Hmm. How did you pay Grantham? Well, I saw the profile of Isaac B. on a window blind. Didn't move even when I fired a shot. That convinced me that it was a bust of the old boy. So I called him up at his home, and he told me that Ransom had a house on Common Avenue, which put it right across the alley from Holzer's. From there, it all fit. Hmm. Well, why didn't Ransom kill Gordon when he fired those shots through the window? Oh, that. He still hoped to recover the peacock for himself at that point. But he didn't know where Gordon had put it, so he couldn't afford to kill him right then. Oh, lovely. You know, Marlo, all in all, we're pretty lucky, Gordon and I. Yeah. Try to keep it, will you, baby? Keep it that way on everything but the horses. Oh, you can make book on that, mister. Mm -hmm. Good night, Phil. Good night, baby. I watched her as she walked away. She looked up at the barred windows where a very willing guy was learning a lesson he needed badly. Tossed him an okay with the fingers of one hand. You know, it made me feel good because I was sure she meant it. It was the kind of a kid who could make it stick. Then I drove home, and all the way I thought about the crazy assortment of people that had become involved because of the ponies and the headless peacock. I was still thinking about it over a glass of milk in my kitchen when I glanced at the newspaper on the table, opened the sports page. Oh, it was like magic. <laughs> My eye was drawn to a box in the corner and down the morning line for tomorrow's races until it stopped at the name Lucky Peacock. Oh, it was perfect. A hunch. A hunch that couldn't miss. Lucky Peacock was a cinch to win by a head. Or maybe he'd lose by a head. Or maybe he'd... Yeah, well. It's no use, Marlowe. Tomorrow you go to the races. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Howard McNear, Eve McVeigh, Jack Moyles, and Peter Lead. Lieutenant Detective Matthews was played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is written by Richard Orant and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure and be with us again when Philip Marlowe says... This time I took a beating and gave one. The man who lived in the dark was afraid. Someone I never got to meet was murdered and a knife-wielding crab was destroyed. All because a girl who hated the water took a boat ride in old Mexico. One step to curing a disease is recognizing it and treating it. Hate is a disease. Recognized by those who refuse to spread the doctrine of hate, by speaking against a fellow American because of his color, race, or religious creed. The treatment to cure the disease of hate is to accept or reject people on their individual worth, 
and to speak up wherever you are against prejudice and for understanding, to do your part to build a truly united America. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time I took a beating and gave one. The man who lived in the dark was afraid. Someone I never got to meet was murdered, and a knife-wielding crab was destroyed. All because a girl who hated the water took a boat ride in old Mexico. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's story, Mexican Boat Ride. It was a rare morning, clear and clean. You know the kind that knocks ten years off your age and makes you taste the sunshine and your orange juice? It was a day to be spent on an open road to someplace new and exciting. But a phone call I'd received had reduced my open road to Carmelita Avenue and nothing more exciting than Beverly Hills. The house I stopped at was one of those you entered through a tunnel of dank, overhanging foliage on a flagstone path grown green with damp moss. A low, thick-walled affair with tiny, barred windows hidden from the sidewalk. I pressed the bell, and a moment later a sallow housekeeper opened the door with what seemed to be a last ounce of strength. She squinted at my card and beckoned me inside. I followed her down a dusky corridor to a heavy closed door, where she signaled me to wait. The air in the house smelled thick and stale. When she came out again, she held the door open for me and motioned me into a room full of darkness. It became nearly complete when the door clicked shut behind me. All I could see was the vague form of a man in smoked glasses propped up on a bed across the room. There's a chair beside you, Marlowe, if you care to sit. Oh, thanks. I'm Carl Estabrook, importer. You may have heard of me. No, I don't think so. Well, no matter. (laughs) Marlowe, I have a peculiar problem. I want to know why my wife, Ona, was on a boat day before yesterday off the coast of Mexico. If you could find out. Well, if that's all you got to go on, I doubt it. No, there's a little more. Huh? Ona and I planned to take vacation together. But when I was confined with this illness, we decided she should go on alone. Oh, then your illness is the reason for the midsummer blackout, huh? Yes. If I expose my eyes to light at any time in the next few weeks, the doctors promise me plenty of pain and virtual blindness. Oh. It's temporary, but tedious to mend. That's why I need a capable man with sharp eyes. To look into what, specifically? The paradox of my wife aboard a boat. Mm -hmm. She has a phobia about them. The mere thought of being on a boat makes her panicky. She drove to Ensenada, Mexico, earlier this week, but believe me, her plans did not include boat rides. Well, tell me, how'd you find out she was on one? Did she write? No, she hasn't written me at all, but that's not unusual for her. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine got back yesterday from a fishing trip down there. The day before, his boat passed another with a girl aboard. He got a good look at her. He was so sure that it was Ona that he hailed her. The girl turned and ran inside. <laughs> it, it bothered him to the extent that when he got home here, he called me to find out if Ona was in Ensenada. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. He didn't get the name of the boat. Look, you want me to go all the way down there just to find out if the girl he saw was Mrs. Estabrook? Right. Uh, what is your fee, Marlowe? Fifty bucks a day, plus expenses. That's the minimum, if I take the job. I don't think I will. When business gets so bad, I have to do divorce work, I'll quit and write my memoirs. No, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. No, no, sit down, Marlowe. Ona and I have had our share of difficulties, true. She's quite a few years younger than I, and used to be a dancer. But, generally speaking, we're happy. Specifically what? I'm worried about her. Here. There's money in this envelope and a recent photograph of my wife. And there's more of both if the need arises. Uh, Incidentally, what kind of a day is it outside? Gorgeous. Well, then you can drive. It's only 250 miles. Yeah. 
By the way, how has the importing business been lately, uh, legitimately speaking? You do have a suspicious mind, don't you? Only when the situation calls for it, and this does. However, I can understand an imagination working overtime here in the dark, Mr. Estabrook. So I'll take your money and go on down to Ensenada and see if anything is wrong. But look, I'm giving you notice beforehand. If it turns out to be family laundry and nothing more, I drop it. You're a reputable man. Just see that I get my money's worth, Marlowe, and you can keep the change. I'll expect to hear from you. When my eyes adjusted to the dazzling glare outside, I looked in the envelope and picture of an impish, dark-haired woman and five $100 bills. For the first time, I realized what Estabrook had meant by keep the change. But it didn't help my attitude even a little. By two o'clock, I was on the road south. A late lunch in La Jolla with an old friend, a routine baggage inspection at the border. And then 70 twisting miles of lonely road brought me to Ensenada, just as the Mexican sun dropped into the sea. I drove past the piers and canneries at the edge of town, and then along the curving shore to the only hotel elegant enough to meet the demands of the woman I figured on Estabrook to be. After I'd gotten a room and cleaned up, I went to the desk and asked for her. She was registered, had number 74, and at the moment was out on the patio. <laughs> All of which sounded ridiculously normal. And I thought again of an imagination at work in a dark room back in L.A. I thanked the clerk in crippled Spanish and turned in time to catch the end of a long, cold stare from a pair of frog-like eyes that bulged out of an otherwise handsome head on a man in a gray gabardine suit. I didn't think my language had been that bad. But when Popeye followed me out onto the patio, I wasn't too sure. There was no mistaking Ona Estabrook. She sat alone at a table in the far corner, a tall, minted gin drink in front of her. So I put on my best tourist-type smile and walked over. Well, Ona Estabrook, this is a pleasure. Enjoying your visit? Why, why yes, very much, but I, I don't think I... Know me? Oh, of course, you wouldn't remember. My name's Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. No, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but you I... You were a really... dancer, weren't you? Before your marriage, I mean? Well, yes, I was a dancer, but you, you'll have to excuse me now. I, I, I'm expecting a friend. I hope oh, you don't mind. Oh, well, just one thing then, Mrs. Estabrook. Would you mind telling me why you were out on a boat day before yesterday? A boat? Mm-hmm. Why do you ask that? Because you hate boats. You have a phobia about them. And yet you were seen aboard one just two days ago. How come? Well, I... Oh, how clumsy of me. <laughs> I've spilled the drink all over my skirt. Excuse me. I'll have to change. That maneuver was as subtle as a bulldozer at work. When she spilled her drink, it was done desperately and fear sent her running for the exit. I turned to follow her as she left the lighted patio and headed down a dark arcade. But a gray gabardine suit and a pair of Popeyes slid out of a chair and beat me to it. I waited until their footsteps faded, which said they turned a corner. Then I started after them. It was strictly follow the leader, but I didn't realize how many were playing the game until a knife point stung at the skin at the soft part of the back about kidney high. Stop, senor, and don't cry out. Don't even say ouch. I turned and saw a mottled red face ugly on a squat long arm body. The ivory-handled knife in his hand could have clipped my spine in one easy thrust. You got a car here, senor? Come on, I speak English good. You got a car? Yeah, I got a car. What's it to you? I am Hayaba, the crab. It's lots to me. What's Let's your go. pitch, Buster? Come on, tell me. <laughs> Martinez says for me to keep a sharp eye on things, to be sure something is not wrong. It looks to me like something is wrong with you, senor. Who's Martinez? <laughs> you going to play possum, senor? <laughs> uh, this one is your car, huh? All right. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I take first your yeah. one. Uh, now, please to get in. You going to drive. Believe it or not, you're making a big mistake, Krabby. Besides, what if I don't want to drive? Oh, you better want to drive, gringo. <laughs> or I kill you right here. Go on, drive. Andale! <laughs> Stop here. And now we get out. Ah, it's nice and quiet here on the beach, no? We walk over there to that old adobe wall. We're gonna have a talk there. It's gonna be dull, Buster. We've got nothing in common. Please, senor, don't make it hard on me. I don't know why you gotta come and mix everything up again when time is running out. Why did you come? 
I needed new haraches. Hmm. Look, senor. You think I'm ugly? You know beauty, Crab, let's face it. See, si. and I can act even uglier. Maybe I could go on the radio and make a big hit, no? <laughs> or maybe I make the big hit on your face. Oh! Mm, don't yeah. try something, senor. Or I kill you with your own gun. Now, the truth. You spoke to the senora about the boat. Why? I forget. Oh. Who are you, senor? A private detective named Marlow. Oh, a private detective. Who are you working for? Dolph Bentley? I never heard of Dolph Bentley. Who's he? You're lying. The senora knows him. I heard her say Dolph Bentley won't make it tonight. Yeah, he's lucky. Si, I tell you something else. He better not make it. Martinez is going to do business with one man only tonight. Now you want to say something? No? Then I'll say it. You take what's going to be left of your face, Bento, oh. Senor Bentley, until you get out of Ensenada and don't come back. Oh. Understand? Ah. Oh. Hey. Uh, oh. Hey. Wait a minute. Wake up, wake up. Wait, wait, stop the crap. Come on. Who are you? Wait, oh, it's you. I'll wait, kill you. Wait, 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 huh? Take it easy, will uh, you? You're in good hands now, Marlo. I'm a fellow uh, American. <laughs> oh. You know, you're pretty lucky, you know that? I am? Oh, sure, yeah. Where'd my pal go? Huh? Oh, him? Oh, I chased him off. You know, it's a wonder he didn't put a knife in you. These uh, fellows are mean with knives. This guy was no slouch with a gun butt, either. Hey. Hmm? Where'd you come from, anyway? Oh, down the beach a ways. I just finished oh. working on my boat, and I was taking a walk, oh. and I heard the commotion came over to see about it. This guy was beating you up, so I yelled and started for him, but he ran. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad somebody stopped him. Thanks very much, Mr. D Roman. Oh. Uh, Lou Roman's my name. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm pleased to meet you, Marlo. Thanks. You know me? Uh, well, yes, I, I took the liberty of looking in your wallet to see that that devil had robbed you. Oh. It doesn't seem so, though. Yeah, I guess I got here just in time. You're a private investigator, I see. Hey, you working on a case now? It's debatable. So far, the case is working on me. Oh. I'd like to find a guy named Dolph Bentley, though. Dolph Bentley? Yeah, yeah. Guy who beat me up had the idea that I was... Ooh. I was hired by Dolph Bentley. Did you ever hear of him? No. No, and I come down here every year to fish, too. Uh -huh. Know a lot of folks around here, but I never heard of that one before. Uh, why are you after him? Well, he's, he's tied up in some way to the crab who... seems to work with another guy named Martinez who... In turn, is going to do some business of some kind tonight with somebody other than Dolph Bentley. I don't know. And it's it's all connected for some screwy reason with a with a woman who took a boat ride the day before yesterday. Well, uh, what about that? Uh, the woman being on a boat, I mean. Oh, well, she can't stand boats. She's afraid of... Oh, my head. Oh, no, wait, wait. Here. Thanks. I'm going to get you some first aid right yeah, away. That's a good idea. Holy smoke, my car. Man, I'll relax, huh? relax. It's right over there. Hey, come on. Let me help you up. All right. Easy oh. now. Easy. Oh. That's it. Now, I'll drive you. Uh, where are you staying? Uh, at the hotel, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, good. Roman. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still busy. Yeah, uh, easy, I got you. I, I gotta get back there. I gotta find that girl, because she's up to her head doing a very nasty mess. Uh, listen, Marlo, huh? if I can help in any way, let me know, will you? <laughs> you know, us Americans have to stick together in a place like this, right? <laughs> That's it. Come on, let's go. Oh. Easy now. <laughs> Blue Roman, the hail fellow, was indeed well met. He found my gun and drove me back to the hotel. A long hour had gone by since Owen Estabrook had run from the patio, followed by the pop-eyed character in the gabardine suit. I tried a room, checked with the desk again, and from there spent 30 minutes peering into corners and balconies and getting nothing but indignant glares from Mexican lovers. Senor, so I left the building and started through the grounds. I worked my way from the stables up into a secluded garden, deserted by all but a marble statue of Montezuma. But when I passed him, groaned. In the dark at my feet lay Haiba the crab. His mottled face twisted into a tortured grin of agony. And sticking straight up just above his belt buckle was the white ivory handle of his senor. own knife. Crab! Crab, who was it? Who got you? Oh, senor, I, I am sorry what I did. Never mind you. that. Who did this? Do you know? Oh, see, si, see. Si. It. Dolph Bentley. Now get a doctor. No, no, you, senor. I. I tell Martinez that Dolph Bentley is. Crab! Yeah. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, 
When you're 65, if you have worked in business or industry, call any office of the Social Security Administration for information about your old age and survivor's insurance. The account number that appears on the Social Security card identifies your wage account. The amount of retirement and family insurance that may be payable is set by this account. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Mexican Boat Ride. Even as the life trickled out of the ugly little man called Aiba, and his face which had been knotted tight in pain went slowly limp and he was still. I knew that I'd have to get next to Dolph Bentley before the importance of owning Estabrook aboard a fishing boat off Ensenada would make any sense. Also, I knew that there was a good chance that said Mr. Bentley and the gentleman in Greg Aberdeen, known to me as Popeyes, were one and the same. So I started back for the hotel. But halfway there, I stopped at the sight of a figure ahead scampering toward an all-alone taxi parked near the main entrance. It was owner Estabrook. I took off after her. When she was in the cab and away before I could get close enough to do any good, I tried the next best thing, which was the sombrero doorman nearby, who I figured might have heard the address she'd given the driver. Yeah, but what I didn't figure was that the doorman might not habla much English. The Senora Estabrook. Uh, si, senor. Her enters libre a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know that. Now, look. Where did her go? Which way in the libre? Libre. Uh-huh. Oh, un momento, senor. Libre, libre. Oh, no, no. Viene, senor. No, Coming look. Pronto. Amigo, I, I don't want a taxi. I do, no libre. No libre. None whatsoever. Ah. Ah, chico, no quiere. Now, please. Hey, Come here. Let's, let's back it up a little, huh? Senora Estabrook in libre, right? Si, senor. Okay. Now, where did she go? What direction? Uh, que dirección? Oh, I comprendo. Uh-huh. The señor. Yeah, the señora. Que dirección? Comprendo? Uh, si, señor. Señora Estabrook, go to the pier, the the fishing pier. Which one? Which fishing pier? Uh, uh, oh, Cual pier? Uh, the small pier, señor. Uh-huh. The little one near the big cannery, the fishes cannery. That's senor. all I want to know. Gracias, amigo, and... Uh-oh. Señor? Senor, what are you seeing? I'm not sure. But even if I were, I wouldn't be able to explain it to you. Buenas noches, pal. Thanks a lot. I had been seeing at the silhouette of a man huddled close to the ground and slinking out from a hotel along a high hedge that led back toward the statue in the body of Aiba, a man who I knew could be the elusive Popeyes. I followed the walk that was close into the hotel until I was on a line with the hedge. Then I started after him fast. I still had a good two yards to go when he heard me and pivoted, so I swung first! Uh, oh! Why, you dirty... Roman, me... wait a minute, hold it! Gee, it's me, Marlo, I'm sorry. Oh! Holy smoke, I... I thought you were someone else. Oh, gargantua, maybe? Oh, brother! Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you hit me with, Marlo? I have everything I had. Hmm. I figured you were Dolph Bentley, and... <sighs> and such, Roman, I didn't want you to get away with murder, literally. Murder? Hey, not that girl you mentioned, Marlo. On Estabrook? Huh? No, no, no. The corpse is that item you sigged away from me over in those ruins. Somebody got to him with his own knife there near the statue. Aha, uh-huh, then I was right. I did see someone move over what? there. Well, yeah, a couple of minutes ago, Marlo. I was on the balcony outside of my room. It faces the garden here, you see. And when I saw you run for the main entrance, I had a feeling that you might be in trouble again, so I came on down here. Well, then what happened? Well, I was about to call out to you when I heard some noise over there near the statue. It was a man. He was running away fast, heading toward those stables. A man wearing gabardine, maybe tan, maybe gray. I... Maybe Dolph Bentley. Thanks, Roman. You've been a big help. When you get back to the hotel, tell him about the dead man, will you? I gotta run. The stable was a robust left fielder's peg to home plate from where we'd been standing. So by the time I got there, I was out of breath and facing nothing more important than thick darkness, a lot of hay, and a couple of horses who couldn't sleep nights talking things over. Until I moved around a corner past the stalls and close to the half-open door of a shack, marked both cabina telefono and the equivalent in English that showed a single unshaded light. And under that, a man standing alone next to a telephone, si. writing something on the back of an envelope. Si. He was wearing a gray gabardine hey, suit, and when he lifted his Popeyes from the paper in front of him, mm. I knew the next move had to be mine, 38 and all. Let it go, Buster. Yeah. Keep your hands close to your sides. Just as you say, senor. I'd be a fool not to obey you. You're so right, a dead fool. So keep that in mind while we chat, won't you, Mr. Bentley? Bentley? Uh-huh. How did you find out who I am? It was easy. All I had to do was listen to a dying man's last two words when I asked him to name his murderer. 
He said, Dolph Bentley, any comment? Yes, you know a lot, senor. Don't resent it, friend. I learned it all the hard way. Don't move, Bentley. I was only changing my position, senor. Which will be prone if you try it again. Now, what do you know about this whole mess and an American girl named Ona Estabrook who I figure is no mobster? Nothing, senor. You're a liar, Bentley. Which brings me to the point. One, why the pressure on the girl, and two, what's so important about her taking a ride on a fishing boat? Come on, brother, it's getting late for a murderer. Start talking straight the first time out. All right. I'll start with a question. Senor, how does all this concern you? You gain a percentage if the smugglers are not interfered with, perhaps? We were talking about the girl, remember? Yes, I remember. But you see, senor, I have little to offer on that score. How little? A single observation. In your country, senor, people who do not mind their own business are called nosy. Here in Mexico, we have another term. Asno. Which means what? Jackass, senor, who, unlike the cat, cannot see in the dark. But can try his best, Bentley. No gun, senor. Okay, amigo, no gun, but this. Uh -huh. Asno. When Bentley met the floor and went out cold, I sagged to one knee. Stayed that way until the air rushing into my lungs quit sounding like sandpaper over a drumhead. Then I got back to my feet and turned on a bracket lamp on the other side of the room. I opened Bentley's jacket, slipped his 32 automatic out of its shoulder holster, emptied the clip and... stopped dead at the shimmer of light dancing on polished silver that I hadn't expected. It was a badge. Below his shoulder holster and pinned to his vest. Republic of Mexico, Department of Customs, Captain! I made a dive for the envelope near the telephone. On the back there was writing in thick pencil, which I finally figured to mean fishing pier near Cannery, 2 a.m. Inside, nothing. On the front, further proof that I'd never met Mr. Dolph Bentley at all, but instead it tangled hard-like with one Captain Juan Descartos intelligence section custom building, Mexico City, Mexico. While trying to revive Captain Descartos, the truth rammed into my mind. Owner Estabrook had rushed off for the pier near the Cannery that Captain Descartes had noted is a good place to be at two o'clock in the morning, which was less than 20 minutes away. And a great time for me to get to my car and the pier. It won't work, senor. Yeah, you're a bright boy, thanks. Well, do you like the job on the car, senor? I think it shines well for the eight pesos you owe me. Uh, nobody asked you to bother, Junior, but I'll see you later. Right now I gotta run, huh? For eight pesos, one dollar you can write, senor. I'll replace the distributor cap. What? Come here, you. But, but senor, it was very dirty all over. Inside, too. The steering wheel, black as can be. Look, I, I ruined my best drag cleaning That's it. tough. Now give me that distributor cap or you'll be the saddest pair of dark eyes between here and the Panama Canal. Senor! Oh... Never mind. Here. You pay me the dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put the cap back where it belongs. Quick, will you? I'm in a hurry. Well, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> the precious 60 seconds ticked off before I was out of the parking lot and driving fast toward the fishing pier near the cannery, where I knew I was finally going to get next to Dolph Bentley and if I made it in time, prevent another murder. But when I screeched to a stop away from the pier, piled out of my car and ran the length of the oil-soaked planking to where a single boat was making ready to cast off. I saw one of the two persons aboard the small catch was Ona Estabrook. The other was Lou Roman, hearty American fisherman. When I stepped aboard, our hunch hit me right between the eyes. I pulled my gun and pointed it an inch above his waist. What are you doing here, Marlo? I might ask you the same question, Roman, or do I call you Bentley from here on out? Marlo, you know, now he can't kill me. Now I don't have to be afraid of him anymore. <laughs> Oh, Marlo, thank goodness you got here in time. Yeah, hooray. The Marines have landed in the form of a private... Cut it out, Bentley, and don't move. Oh, no, what do you mean about being afraid? What's your connection with this fisherman here? Well, it, it was an accident, Marlo. A mix-up in our baggage. Lou Roman and I both happened to stop for customs inspection at the border at the same time, and our suitcases were switched. I didn't notice it at the time, but when I got to the hotel, I discovered the mistake and went to Roman's room to correct it. But instead, you found Bentley here posing as Roman, right? Yes. He killed him, Marlo. He told me he did. That's a dirty lie. Roman's all right. He's in Chicago. No, he's not. He's dead. You killed him. Someplace between here and Tijuana, Marlo. He said I'd get the same treatment if I opened my mouth. Then he's the one who forced you to go out on that boat yesterday. Oh, that Stay back, Bentley. Yes. 
so that people wouldn't be suspicious, he made me appear at the hotel, in the patio there, at the restaurant. Well, why didn't you run? Well, I couldn't. He wasn't around. Another man was. A horrible man with large eyes that never left me. Yeah. So why don't you drop it, Marlowe? No sale, Bentley. You see, I know that the horrible man with the large eyes can't be one of your henchmen. His badge says so. What? Badge? He's an officer, Marlowe? Yeah, captain owner. Give up, Bentley? You had better. There are too many men ready to take you. Descados. <laughs> Where'd you come from? Oh, I have been here quite a while. But your story was so interesting, I just couldn't interrupt. Marlowe took you for Dolph Bentley, Captain Descartes. You played along because you didn't know who he was, is that it? Yes, senora, and I did not find out until I heard Bentley call Marlowe a private eye. <laughs> You're not mad at me, Captain, huh? Even though I bungled your plan to capture Martinez, and uh, not to mention our little meeting at the stables. <laughs> uh, senora, do not say that you bungled the job of catching Martinez. It was more a matter of uh, priority. Uh, por favor, senora, the tacos. Of course, here you are. Gracias. You see, Senor Marlowe, I am certain that one day I will catch Martinez. But not at the cost of letting a murderer kill again. Hmm. But, Senor Marlowe, there is one thing that puzzles me. The murder of the one known as Haiba. Oh, Martinez henchman. Well, you see, Captain, he knew that a man named Dolph Bentley was mixed up in this because he'd overheard Ona and her keeper, then called Lou Roman, talking about him. He wanted to know more. Also, he couldn't figure who I was. So he beat you up? Correct. Bentley, of course, only saved my life because... It was an easy way to find out just how much Haiba did know, after which he got to him. Enough? Not quite, senor. There is still one thing. How did you know that Lou Roman was actually Bentley? On a hunch, Captain. And by positive identification from you, Ono, when we were on the boat. But um, now it's my turn. I got a question for you, honey. Have you had enough vacation? Uh -huh. Matter of fact, Marlowe, I wired my husband just before we came in to eat. Oh. I... I said the change didn't your world good. Be home tomorrow to stay. Love always. Well, Captain, will you pass the tacos, please? They're, they're awfully good, really. It was late the next afternoon, and owner Estabrook was already gone when I checked out of the hotel. Said goodbye to Captain Dos Catos. Adios, amigo and headed north for the border, where two hours later I stopped for customs inspection of my baggage. It was dark, and I was only 50 miles from Los Angeles before I realized exactly what that inspection had meant, because it was then, for the first time, that I noticed that the little cowhide suitcase on the seat next to me, which should have been mine, was tagged differently. The name and address of a man who lived in Long Beach, California. <laughs> I got there, I kept driving. I knew I could ship it to him and ask for mine in exchange when I got home. Oh, yes. I'd had just about enough for a while. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Mary Shipp, Harry Bartell, Nestor Piva, Bill Boucher, Ralph Moody, Bill Shaw, and Jerry Farber. The special music is written by Richard Aron. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with death on my doorstep and got worse when I lied to a sympathetic bull, was pistol whipped by a gorilla with dimples and fought with a kitten on the keys. And it might have gone on that way all night if I hadn't been helped by the king of the beasts. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.